So you may know the famous metaphor or famous quote where he says, it's not the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that you get your dinner. It's because they're selfish that you get your dinner. Adam Smith defines the market and the invisible hand of the market. But what he forgot, what he ignored was the fact that he personally got his dinner because his mom did the shopping, <laughs> prepared dinner in the kitchen, served it to him, and then she did the dishes. Hi, and welcome to the New Rules of Business by Chief. I'm Carolyn Childers. And I'm Lindsay Kaplan, and we are the co-founders of Chief, the network of the most powerful women in business. Each episode, we unravel complex business trends and challenge preconceived notions of leadership. And today, we're digging into productivity. For decades, we've been idolizing this concept of being productive and seeing it as this path to achieving success, happiness, and even better sleep. So today, we've got five secret productivity hacks that will boost your performance and blow your mind. Stay tuned, Carolyn, because number four is epic. (laughs) I don't think that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. What we're actually going to focus on goes a lot deeper than all those tips we've all seen and tried before. Because shouldn't we first ask ourselves, why? Why do we chase productivity? Why do we assign this one metric so much importance in our professional and personal lives? And why do I always click on those damn productivity links? Probably because you need some help. Okay, that's a whole other podcast episode. (laughs) But back to productivity. What do we really get out of all of our efforts to track, measure, and maximize everything? What are we leaving out of this equation? And what would happen to our businesses and even our entire economy if we just stopped? All very good questions. And our guest today is going to help us find some answers. So take it away, Linz. Letitia Vito is a futurist and the author of Goodbye Productivity. Thank you so much for joining us today, Letitia. We are excited to hear about your take on this. But first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So I changed jobs and careers and even countries multiple times. My mother's German, my father's French, but I moved to the UK with my whole family about eight years ago. And I tried to become an employee. That didn't work. That didn't work out for me. So, but that's where I started my company to do research about the future of work. And I haven't had any other jobs since then. Why didn't it work out? You tried to become an employee. I'm fascinated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was a, a teacher. I had a lot of autonomy in my work. I had a lot of freedom. And suddenly becoming an employee in HR, it was an American company, and it was the European office in London. And that's the first time I was really managed. I had a manager, I mean, you know, in the strict sense of the word, and I found that extremely alienating. And that was probably a realization for me that that wasn't for me. And it sort of triggered an interest in freelancing. So first, because I found subordination unbearable. (laughs) And in my late 30s at the time, I would still continue to ask myself, what do you want to be or to do when you grow up? Ah. Which is a strange question when you're in your late 30s. (laughs) (laughs) Perhaps it was the second thing that made me realize that those questions in and those lives of transitions were probably the sign of changes profound changes when it comes to work and career than my own situation and that I was just a symptom of something bigger. At least that's the starting point. That's how I started writing about the rise of freelancers. That was the first subject, career switches, the impact of the digital transition on the way we work. And that was all before the pandemic. And then the pandemic came and the things that I had worked on became even more relevant. So I realized I had a a very good business to (laughs) a thriving business on a subject that was um, that was becoming even more topical. So the journey into freelance started to get you to really explore the future of work. Was it the pandemic that got you to shift into the topic of productivity in particular? Or what was the motivation for that? 
So I moved from London to Munich in 2020. It was just between lockdowns. So we had several lockdowns in Europe. It was between lockdowns. But whereas in the UK and France, most schools had reopened or had reopened faster. So children were going back to school in spite of the pandemic. In Germany, they were not. So it's a bit like in the US, schools remain closed for you know more than a year. And yes, I realized that behind every so-called productive worker, there is somebody who has to either work part-time, stay at home, be with the children. <laughs> There's a lot of unpaid labor that goes into paid labor. And this realization I really had when I was stuck at home with children who couldn't go to school and I had to help them with their homework and help them with school in a language that for them was a foreign language at the time, that was extremely challenging. And I was so mad, so angry most of the time that it led me to really focus more on that subject of productivity. I was like, productivity is a lie. How surprised should you be that most people just cannot work normally when they have all these extra chores or extra constraints in their lives? Most people know that, but I think it was, it did come as a revelation to a lot of people. Yeah. So can you talk more about that, of how productivity has traditionally been defined and where the origin of productivity even came from? Yeah, so traditionally, it's presented as a ratio. It's presented as an output-input ratio that is designed to measure how effective a product factor is. So one hour of human labor, how much can you produce in one hour? And you can compare from one time to the next, or how much you produce with one machine. And there are different units, but basically it's meant to measure the effectiveness of that unit of production, of product. And the, the concept really came with the Industrial Revolution, and it has been central ever since in the way we measure the economy, in the industrial economy. And it kind of made perfect sense in the world of standardized goods and interchangeable commodities like a ton of wheat or a number of screws that come out of an assembly line or something like that. And you can really measure it easily. And so the concept itself, one of its most famous fathers, I would say, is Adam Smith. He didn't use the word productivity, but in his book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, he introduced the fundamental concept of division of labor. So productivity is not used, but it's the justification of all of it, because it's the idea is that by dividing tasks, you make individuals more productive, more effective, and you can increase wealth. So that's the heart of the wealth of nations, basically. And with Adam Smith, the beauty of the whole thing is that the blind spot of productivity is already there. It was genius, the whole concept of division of labor, but he completely ignored a lot of the important things that would be ignored forever <laughs> and are still ignored today. He ignores domestic work. He ignores women's work. He ignores family life and perhaps even services in general. So you may know the famous metaphor or famous quote where he says, it's not the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that you get your dinner. It's because they're selfish that you get your dinner. Adam Smith defines the market and the invisible hand of the market. But what he forgot, what he ignored was the fact that he personally got his dinner because his mom did the shopping, <laughs> prepared dinner in the kitchen, served it to him, and then she did the dishes. I am rolling my eyes at this because <laughs> it's just classic, right? Classic to speak about the economics without thinking about what's happening in the household and all of that labor and productivity that goes into allowing people to then go to work. Yeah. And I'm using air quotes around work. Exactly. It's the unpaid work and there's the visible tip that's the productive paid work. But if only we could have a ratio that measures the visible, invisible, <laughs> How many hours of invisible work does one hour of productive work actually take? 
If only we could measure that, we'd have a whole different view of the economy. It's the invisible legs of the market, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we have been, as a culture, obsessed with productivity for years, right? Buying self-help books and gadgets, and all of this is in pursuit of getting more and more and more productive. What caused this maniacal focus on personal productivity? It didn't start yesterday. So perhaps the first thing is that everything that's collective at work has been in decline for a couple of decades. Unions, a sense of identity and belonging to a team. So it makes us think at the individual a lot more. How much more can I individually, personally do to make my situation better? It's increased this pressure and anxiety on individuals to be more productive as if it was entirely and only up to them to increase their own wealth or increase their own efficiency. And the second thing is the blurring of the lines between work and life. Productivity is everywhere because smartphones and emails are everywhere and it invades other dimensions of our lives so that progressively we've started using those metrics and this ideology by asking questions such as how do we make sleep more productive? How do we make leisure, pleasure, sex, and whatever more productive? And we've even reversed things that we want to sleep better so as to be more productive rather than the other way around, because the economy is at the service of well-being and not the other way around. And now it feels like it's a normal question to ask, how do you increase well-being so as to increase productivity as if it was the final goal of everything. And that's a deep ideological change that makes the lives of people a lot harder. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons we were really excited to have you on is that here in the U.S., the Department of Labor reported in August, I believe, of this year, the first big drop in worker productivity since it started tracking it in 1948, which obviously sent a lot of executives, a lot of economists into total panic mode. And I'm curious if you've seen this trend in other parts of the world. How do you think broader economies and cultures really think about productivity? That's a great question. Actually, we've witnessed this drop in a lot of different countries. So it's not just the US, but it's stronger in the US than elsewhere. I would say that some of the explanations are also kind of interesting because it's like this surprise, surprise when there's a lot of turnover, when the knowledge that's usually transmitted from one generation to the next goes missing and all this informal knowledge about how information is shared and how to work together is not as solid as it used to be. And surprise, surprise, when you have to train others most of the time, or when you go into training because you're just a beginner, you're not as productive. So it's largely the result of all those changes and the great resignation and all those people switching jobs that make them less productive. So it's just this focus, or rather it sheds light on all those collective tasks, like training others, helping others at work, that are not measured as productivity, but that are no less valuable. So that's perhaps is the first thing. And the second, again, surprise, surprise, when it comes to the US, is this came as a revelation. When you have kids at home and no childcare solutions, you're not as productive as you could be without them. And that's a strong difference with perhaps most European countries where access to childcare is on average significantly better than it is in the US, where the school system is more generous and probably compulsory schooling starts at three in France, at the age of three. And before that, there are lots of facilities that you know are really widely accessible. It's not perfect. It can absolutely be criticized. And when I speak to French people, I criticize it abundantly. But the basis is very, very different. It sounds pretty utopian to me, sitting here in the States, <laughs> trying to figure out what to do with my two and a half year old. <laughs> yeah, it does. And perhaps there's one last fundamental difference, I would say, is everything that regards holidays and work-life balance. 
in Germany, where I live now, they have this beautiful concept of the fire abend. So fire as in party evening or something, <laughs> partying. <laughs> when you leave work, work is behind you. You're not supposed to take it with you. And traditionally, you're not expected to be, you know, at your boss's beck and call and answer your emails all the time. And work stops relatively early. And then you go to the lake and have a swim and you have all these outdoors activities. And that's just the norm. It's interesting that you talk about that barrier between work and rest. And yet here in the States, we're tracking people's mouse clicks. What happens when we make up metrics to just track productivity of white collar workers? How can that backfire? It has backfired because there's this incentive to manipulate the metric mm. that you're supposed to be seen as working. So there's a form of presenteeism, even online, even remotely, where you start to play in that the theater of productivity rather than productivity. One concrete example is that you could just switch off your phone and computer, take a blank sheet of paper if you want to create something new and think and just be in disconnect mode for a couple of hours to do some deep work. And that's not something you would do now because you know that others might think you're just taking a nap <laughs> rather than doing some creative work. And so the incentive is to be seen as being productive rather than to be productive. And this continuous measuring in real time of work, even for white collar workers, is, I think, backfiring because there is no time to recuperate or to have this fertile moment of, you know, thinking and resting and have these different modes for your brain to renew its cognitive abilities. So I think we've lost a lot in that sense. Yeah. So you were talking before about like all of the infrastructure that ultimately really do and should make the hours in work more productive. Do you see research that shows that, that, you know, when you have that infrastructure to support people, that there is that greater productivity? Or are you in many ways just saying like productivity is such a flawed metric that you can't measure those things? It is a flawed metric. What you see is you have more GDP. Not necessarily individual productivity, because what that means is that there is more paid labor and less unpaid labor. You will have more people in the workforce, more people in paid jobs, and fewer people at home doing unpaid labor. So it's, yeah, in, in increased GDP, but not necessarily increased productivity, because the way productivity is measured in service jobs, it is usually measured as low. So nurses are regarded as less productive than engineers. And sometimes it's just because it's very much harder to measure. What does it mean to be productive if you are holding someone's hand when they're dying? I mean, what is productive in that case? Is it the number of hands that you will hold or is it the overall health of the person or the spiritual way you will accompany them dying. I mean, it's just that it doesn't make any sense in a lot of activities to apply the logic of productivity. And because we use certain metrics, a lot of those essential workers, including nurses and teachers, will be regarded by economists as less productive. The same with a lot of things that we need to have more metrics than just one, because if we measure only one thing, then we will have a lot of negative externalities and we need to keep track of the goal. If the goal of your company is to create value, if the goal of the economy is to increase the well-being of people and their life expectancy, for example, or low infant mortality or things like that, you know, then you have a host of other metrics that you can use to measure the quality of the economy or the way it evolves. And right now, what we've seen over the last couple of years is that GDP increased, but a lot of the other metrics that are used, for example, in the 
Human Development Index that was developed for that very reason about three, between three and four decades ago, like life expectancy, like the education level of young adults, like infant mortality or maternal mortality. All those things are increasing, not just in the U.S., sadly, even in a lot of European countries. This is a sign that there is a disconnect and a growing disconnect between GDP and productivity as principal metrics and what they are supposed to serve in the first place. They should be the servants rather than the other way around. So if you could rewrite the definition of productivity, what would work better for everybody and what would be better reflected as a macroeconomic indicator? Something that measures collective productivity a lot more. So you could actually use those metrics that I just mentioned, like infant mortality, if you're a nation, and then if you're a company, there are other metrics that you can use, like overall, how your collective intelligence works if you're in services or if you're in the knowledge economy. What matters is how well information is shared, how new ideas are generated. And you could use metrics such as measure the gender gap. If the gender gap is going up, there's something wrong with the way you measure productivity. That's a clear signal. I like that. Yeah. So what technological or societal shifts do you think really needs to happen for our kind of collective focus on productivity to shift into more of that definition? We need to take better account of all the negative externalities of the way we do things. And sadly, we have this constant reminders that our resources are finite and that the world is burning. That clearly is hopefully going to be a wake-up call because the way we completely destroy our resources very much connected to all of this. And that's going to be a bottleneck. What we call the shortage of workers. In France, the level of employment of 55 to 64-year-olds is fairly low because they're very much discriminated against. And yet, a lot of employers say that the shortage of workers and candidates is their number one bottleneck at the moment. So this bottleneck, this shortage is probably going to help people realize that the way we measure productivity is flawed because, and we need to do things differently. So if you could write a new rule for business that could resolve all of the problems with productivity today, (laughs) what would your new rule of business be? Easy question, Lindsay. Such an easy one. (laughs) Just a new rule. So easy. Super easy question. If you're an employer or if you're a manager, design work with a default persona in mind that is this single mom with two-year-olds or with babies. If you design work in such a way that a single mom can have an ambitious career and climb the corporate ladder and do any job then this is the ideal world you want to have because it means that work is sustainable for everybody else. Those without children, those who are not single, those who are in all sorts of households with different organizations because they have more free time, because they have better work-life balance, because it doesn't take 80 hours a week to achieve success, to achieve the highest level in the organization. Well, we have absolutely loved this discussion, and we always love to end our episodes with one question in particular, which is, what is the best piece of leadership advice and perhaps the worst piece of leadership advice that you've ever received? I was a teacher for many years. That was the longest job that I had. And the best piece of advice I received was this you don't have to know it all and you don't have to show that you know everything. What you need to teach is a critical mind and a method to ask the right questions. And that was super liberating. And I think it works for leadership as well as it does for teaching. Very much so, for sure. Any worst pieces of advice that you have have ever received? Well, it's the, <laughs> the other <laughs> side of that same coin, right? When you yeah. don't show your weaknesses and be strong and be tough. And we all have the examples of teachers like that that we had who you felt were offended when a question was asked that questioned their 
knowledge. Well, we loved having you on the show. Really appreciate you spending the time with us and talking about this topic. Would you say it was a productive use of our time? (laughs) (laughs) Depend on the way you track things. (laughs) What do your metrics say about the productivity of this recording session? Lindsay measures in laughs per episode. That's what she measures by. (laughs) That's a very good metric. (laughs) GPE. Giggles per episode. (laughs) Giggle count is high. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. That was Letitia Vito, author of Goodbye Productivity. And while Linz, I don't know if I'm fully ready to say goodbye to productivity all together just yet. No, I'm ready to say goodbye productivity and hello nap tap. <laughs> Is that one of your five secret productivity hacks, a nap? Because <laughs> it's not all that surprising. <laughs> Seriously, though, what stuck out for me is how we get those whys totally backward. We push ourselves to do things like power nap so that we can be more productive rather than the other way around. Exactly. We position productivity as the end goal in and of itself rather than as the indicator. And honestly, it's not always the right indicator to use. And it's definitely not the only one to look at. Like when Letitia talked about how when productivity is up, GDP might go up too, but at the same time, quality of life indicators go down. And you can see how what she described at the macroeconomic level could trickle down to one business or even just one team. Yeah, if we overfocus on productivity, and especially if we measure it in an arbitrary way where you're focused on what looks productive rather than digging into what actually gets produced. Well, then you might max out those metrics at the expense of others, like employee engagement and well-being. Really true. That's all for this episode of the New Rules of Business by Chief. But stay tuned for our bonus episode, Five Ways to Hack Yourself into Being Unproductive While Napping with our host, Lindsay Kaplan. And my special guest, a bottle of scotch. And don't miss out on all of our Chief content. You can get more podcast episodes by following this show on your favorite podcast app. And if you're more of a social media person, find us and join the conversation on LinkedIn. But if you're ready to up the ante and you're thinking about becoming a member of the Chief Network, which you should do, head to our website, chief.com, where you can apply. As a member, you'll be connected with the world's most powerful network of executive women. Thanks, Sharon Yee, Courtney Conley, Mercy Harper, Blaine Edens at Chief, and to our production team, Pod People, Rachel King, Matt Sav, Amy Machado, Danielle Roth, Madison Lusby, Hannah Patterson, and Michael Aquino. Our music is by Colin Hatch. I'm Carolyn Childers. And I'm Lindsay Kaplan. I'm taking a nap. Thanks for listening. You think everybody else thinks we're as funny as we do? No. (laughs) 